Six cooks, <laughs> six countries, six incredible journeys. <laughs> Stepping outside their comfort zone. It's not for the faint-hearted, for sure. Our cooks will travel far and wide. Route 7 all the way. To find some of the most exciting food on the planet. If you're back in the UK, you've got tandoori chicken. Nothing like this. It's beautiful. This is the best food I've had in Egypt. It's pure, it's got heritage, it's got love in it, you know. They'll go off the beaten track. Crocodile. Crocodile sausages. Meeting extraordinary people. Exploring ways of life unchanged for centuries. No electric blenders in the jungle. Have to do everything by hand. Take your life into your own hands. We're on the road now. As they travel, they'll see how the language of food transcends cultural differences. I've never hoofed on a cheese before. <laughs> and a world away from home. This is why I love Australia. There's no excuse for a bad pie in Australia. Yeah. This is the beginning. Where do we end? They'll learn lessons that could change the way we cook forever. I've been cooking a barbecue wrongly all my life. Wow. This time, hairy biker Dave Myers is travelling to one of the world's most ancient cultures. The exciting truth is that Egyptian food is the oldest in the world, and that's what I'm here to find. Venturing up the Nile to discover where baking began... I feel like I'm Indiana Jones and the Lost Loaf. He'll find hospitality he'll never forget. I love Egypt! And go in search of the oldest recipes in the world. I could sit there and eat the lot. <laughs> I've travelled the world with my best mate, Sai King, but he's not been well. The poor sausage. Although he's on the mend, he's not ready for a big trip like this. So for the first time, I'm going away without him. I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you, no. Because we always look out for each other, don't we? Well, yeah. Look, just be safe, will you? That's the main thing. As a little treat, I'm cooking Sai one of the Egyptian dishes that he'll be missing. It's one of our favourites. Coriander. Salt. Baking powder, bit of bounce. Oh, nice. It's beginning to look a bit like falafel. What are you doing? I'm making a list. What for? Your presents. Oh, no. Oh, go on. For what? I've got a camel. You give me the ump, you do. <laughs> a drum. Yeah, right. How would they do it? They would have fallen apart like they did last time. We've got a pan of Bombay mix. They've disintegrated. <laughs> How many times have we done this? OK, so if nothing else comes out of this trip to Egypt, I am going to learn how to make perfect falafel. My trip will take me to the crossroads of Africa, Asia and Europe. I'm starting in Egypt's beating heart, one of the world's greatest cities, Cairo. I'm in Egypt. Do you know what? I love it. I love the bustle. All those nooks and crannies and back streets. Look at that. I love Middle Eastern food, and I've travelled pretty widely in this part of the world, but you can't claim to have the full picture until you come here. For thousands of years, merchants travelling the spice route have set out their stalls on Cairo's streets, and this is where the classic flavours of Middle Eastern cuisine first came together. There's got to be some amazing food here. And it somehow, it hasn't made it, you know, onto our culinary psyche. Where would one go for an Egyptian? In fact, can you name me one Egyptian dish? I've been fascinated by tales of ancient Egypt since I was a boy, but that was all tombs and mummies. Now, I want to get to know the food. As one of the greatest civilizations ever known, Egypt's influence spread way beyond its shores. 
so I'm hoping to track down not only some ancient recipes, but the origins of dishes we know and love back home. Now I've read if you want to find the best food in Cairo, you have to look on the street. And to breakfast like an Egyptian, that means fool. Looks good. Is it fool? Fool. Well, I found a fool, you know, and it's like beans for breakfast. But beans are an Egyptian staple. You know, I mean, the average Egyptian's about 1,500 quid a year, and beans are really important. And, you know, they'll give you a bit of get up and go. There's a whole problem, a million Egyptians every day. Pick up a plate of beans and say, beans means fool. Oh, he's got a salad. Hello. Hello. Got some fool. 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 With tahini. With tahini. Uh, little hog. Ah. Uh, with such a little hog. Shota? Shota. Shota? Yeah. Uh, and... Bacle italiano? No, poco. Poco? Poco italiano. <laughs> I want the full fool experience. It's a bit. Olio. Olio. Um, calde. Calde. Hot, yeah. Good. See, Good. I mean, grazie. <laughs> it's bonkers, I end up trying to speak Italian. I can't speak Italian on a food stall in Egypt when I come for my morning beans for breakfast. It's brilliant. Olio, olio, calde. Ooh. <laughs> I've got a sweetie. I'm up for my pudding. It certainly beats going down the cath at home, you know, and having my beans on toast. Ah. So that's me fool. Is that my bread? I Aish? Oh, smashing. Ah, oh, shukran. Proper Egyptian breakfast. Look at that bread. Now, what's this taste like? Good. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's very good, isn't it? Really good. Yeah. It's great. It's spicy. It's tasty. It's beans that are soaked and then they're boiled in the morning with some spices. And it's like a bean porridge. Then I've got this salad. I've got some lemon. I've got some very, really light pickles. Then I've got the aubergine. Oh, that's hot. I think it's going to be terrible wind. Beans are a cornerstone of Egyptian cuisine, but a must-have at breakfast, lunch and dinner is bread. Grazie. <laughs> I know a fair bit about baking bread, but no one knows more than the Egyptians. Their word for bread, Aish, means life. You can smell this bread all the way from the other side of Cairo. Yes, it's really good bread, isn't it? Yeah. Mustafa is a Cairo foodie and chef who wants to show me how important bread is to the people here. So is this everyday Egyptian bread? We eat like five loaves of that bread every day, so it's our main stable diet. What's it called? It's called oh, baladi bread. Baladi, baladi bread. is local. Well, look at that. You talk about freshly baked bread. Yes. It couldn't get any fresher, could it? Do you want to try a piece? I'd love some. Absolutely. Ashraf, I know what I Wow. Try it. Smell the bread. Oh, it smells great. It's made actually just yeast, flour, Brand and water. That's it. That's why it's not chewy. It's not gooey. It's have that nice sort of flavor. Nice bite to it, isn't it? Baladi bread. It's very much like our pita bread, but thinner. After this, pita is going to feel like chewing a flip flop. How many loaves of bread a day would this bakery make? Average of um, between uh, nineteen and twenty thousand wow. loaves of bread a day in twelve hours. But every loaf's the same size. It's all the same size, and that's the talent. In Egypt, access to bread is almost a human right, and production is subsidised by the government. The poor get their five loaves a day for the equivalent of just two and a half pence. So important is bread that in 2008, threats to the subsidy led to riots, with chants of bread, freedom and social justice. Revolutionaries eventually overthrew the government. Even we have a say, you can't touch anything we have, but don't touch my bread, because that's the only thing I'll fight you for. It's the people's bread. Yes, it is. See, he makes it look so simple so and so easy. One, two, flip, flip. You flip, you flip back, you just use your hand to. Oh, he turns it over. Yes. Yeah. To meet demand, these guys need to produce a loaf every two seconds. 
Luckily, the thin loaves take only a couple of minutes to bake. Mustafa tells me there are thousands of these backstreet bakeries in Cairo. And wherever you find a bakery, you'll find a nearby stall selling fresh falafel. Why is it right that it's the oldest falafel in it's, the world? It's the same war in everywhere. Like, everybody's claiming it's, uh, we created this, we created that, but falafel or tamaya is Egyptian. The word itself is uh, driven, driven from the word falafel. It's three yeah. chapters, means full of beans, and that's what falafel is. Now, to my mind, that means Egyptian fava bean falafel must predate the chickpea falafel that we get at home. The chickpeas is a bit dense. The, right. the, the, the fava beans is more fluffier. Yeah. Get, they're nice crispy from the outside, really nice creamy from the inside. I must admit, I have problems with falafel. OK. I've tried making it with the fava beans, you know, with the dried broad beans. I've tried with chickpeas. My falafel fall to bits. The problem is if you boil the, the beans, actually make it fall apart. You don't, but that's where we go. I've been boiling my beans. No, no you uh, just soak them for in, in warm water for a uh, uh, couple of hours in warm water. If you use cold water, you use you, you soak it overnight. Yeah. So it give you that nice um, creamy and nice texture like you will taste in here. Fantastic! It is a world of beans, Egypt, isn't it? It is. It's just like it's wow. really like, that's how it looks like. It's like like nice bowls. No. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah, it is really nice. You want to try it? Yeah. What's good about it is you get all the nutrition. You get the salad, you get the tahini, which is a sesame seed paste. Yeah. You get the, all those nice greens and uh, with the beans, the proteins. So, I and need... the baladi bread. Yeah, the people's bread, country bread. Yeah, of course. You want to try? Mm. That's delicious, now. The texture is incredible. Got so crispy on the outside, in the middle is soft. But you can taste the herbs. Yeah. There's all the flavour. This is superb. I want to try one just by itself. Thank Please. you. The crunch, mm. I just love it. Oh, that's the best falafel I've ever had. Oh, just like yours, right? <laughs> no, mate, no, no, no. No, but I'll tell you what, I've, now I have something to aim for. <laughs> I'm beginning to see how simple food like this, and bread in particular, has shaped Egyptian culture, and that seems to have been the case for thousands of years. If I am to understand the cuisine here and see how its influence has spread across the world, I need to travel back in time. In Egypt, that's easily done. So I'm leaving downtown Cairo and heading into the land of the pharaohs. Hello. Can I have one for the big one? One? Is it just one pyramid or do you see the three? Oh. Is this the whole area outside? Like? Everything. Oh, brilliant. Area. Yeah, just one, one please. Thank you. Eight quid for one of the seven wonders of the world. Ooh, that's a bargain. Shukran. Thank you. Today is the first day of Eid El Adha, the four-day feast of the sacrifice, and Cairo's crowds have popped out to stretch their legs. But for me, seeing the pyramids is the fulfillment of a boyhood dream. They're absolutely breathtaking. When this was built, you know, four and a half thousand years ago, we were just starting to balance, you know, Stonehenge, one big lump on two lumps. And look at it. It makes my heart flutter a bit. You know, like when you stand on top of a tall building and look down, it's that kind of feeling. And yet, when you, when you see something that's so familiar, but it's bigger, it's more impressive, it's, it's more awe-inspiring than any cathedral I've ever seen. But, you know, it's taken me 57 years to get to this point, and it was well worth the wait. I'd always thought the pyramids were built by slaves, but, in fact, they were built by paid labourers. Their take-home pay wasn't in cash. They were paid in bread and beer. 
so you could say that this lot was built on the back of the humble loaf. It's great to see so many people here soaking up the culture, but the crowds are mad. It's time to escape. Well, this trip just keeps getting better and better. I finally get a bike at last. It's going to be chaos. I've even got a little camera so you can watch with us. Roads out for the faint hearted. There seem to be no rules. <laughs> Overtaken by a lad on a pink scooter. On a plateau above the drifting desert sands is Saqqara, home to the world's oldest pyramids. In the surrounding dunes, they've found thousands of tombs, and I can't wait to see inside one. Incredibly, I've got the place to myself. Oh. This is the tomb of T. Apart from being the royal hairdresser, he was in charge of the pharaoh's fields. His tomb is engraved with images of farming from four and a half thousand years ago. Look, this one's interesting. This is like, this is like the story of baking, isn't it? You, you've got pictures here of people and the, 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 the kind of grinding the wheat. And there, judged by their elbows, they appear to be kneading the dough. It was so clever, the Egyptians. Those conical pots up there, they're like the proving baskets we have today to put the bread in, but they do bake them in them as well as proving. And as you go down, you can see there they're shielding the faces because of the heat from the fire and they're cooking them in the pots. Gosh, and look here, the scribes, they're recording everything. Now, could it be, it's almost like they're, they're writing the first ever cookbook. You know, this is a step-by-step -step guide on how to make a four and a half thousand year old loaf. So that, to my mind, makes it the world's oldest recipe. It's fascinating. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Egypt's farming history stretches back millennia as people settled all along the banks of the Nile. 70 miles south of Cairo is the oasis of Fayoum. I'm told it's the Garden of Egypt, so there should be some great produce to be found there. Egyptian history is as rich as it is long. When our forefathers gave up life as hunter-gatherers and started farming, one of the first places cultivated was the Nile Valley. 10,000 years ago, rich soil deposited by the river attracted the first settlers. Today, an incredible 95% of Egyptians live along the river, and that makes it more than just a tad crowded. <laughs> to spread the river's life-giving waters further afield, ancient Egyptians became masters of irrigation, and as a result, were able to produce a huge range of crops. Now, I've read about a plant that's indigenous to Egypt and has almost mythical health-giving properties. It's called Molokia, and it's what's brought me here today. Hello, Ruby. I'm Dave. Uh, it's good to meet you. Fine. Hey. Ruby is a fellaheen, or tenant farmer, on a property which has guest houses, and I'm told he grows Molokia. Right. After you, sir. Thanks to irrigation, Ruby is also able to grow sweet corn, lemons, bananas and oranges, all of which will soon be ready to harvest. Wow! Mm. Not right yet. 
Oh, hopefully it'll <laughs> Around the edges of the fields are olive trees. Look at those. I've never done this before, you know, olives from a tree. Mm. Mm. It's not like I thought, look. It tastes slightly spicy, it's there, but it's very different to what we get in a jar at home. I mean, obviously, the oil's there, it's heaving with oil. But it's so fertile here, isn't it? It is like the Garden of Plenty. Is he going to climb a tree? Um, I'm not going up. Have you seen the spikes on the palm? He's not going up there. He is going up there. Go on, your neck. Push shin up that tree. He's in his 60s. He's just disturbed a hive of bees. Here we go. Crikey. I've only ever really seen dates. We take it for granted in that cellophane wrapper at Christmas. Here we go. <laughs> this is my first fresh date, straight from the tree. Couldn't be any better. It's sticky. It's unctuous. Oh, it's like masala wine, Madeira. Who told me Christmas is rolled into one? That was brilliant, Ruby. I know, right? You're still doing better. Huh? Still doing. Still. There seems to be a division of labour on the farm. Ruby tends to the fields while the house and animals are looked after by his wife, Nadia. Hey? All right. Just up there. Oh, it's heavy. Oh, all right, sorry. <laughs> Say, but good? Ask me first. Hey, thank you. I think she said I'm a man. All, all, all the girls are out having a laugh. <laughs> So what 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 what's the bag made from? Goat skin. Do you just fill this up every day with some milk, and then how long do you leave the whole thing for? So you leave it for three days and shake it. Smells cheesy. Humphy. What like the bagpipes? <laughs> no? Yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> Good? Do you know, I've never huffed on a cheese before. I like I'm wearing it. My beard soaked in cheese. My glasses, I can't see. You're covered in it and all. Do you want to... I'll tell you what, it isn't like this with Delia Smith, is it? See, that's, that's professional huffing for you. Look. Big fish, little fish, cardboard box. <laughs> Having made a doubtful contribution to the cheese making, I'm off to gather the ingredients for the mythical, unpronounceable soup. Is it makl makla ma? Mak makla? Mak. Mulhi. Mulhi. Sounds Scottish. هو لازم كله طبيخ لازم يكون عليها ملوخية عشان أفضل أكل وأحسن أكل الملوخية هي بقول عليها عندنا إحنا فلاحين دي اسمها الشريفة في الطبيخ. Tastes nice. It's quite bland. It's a bit like privet. Of course, being Egypt, the soup has to be served with bread. The loaves made in homes like Ruby's are flatbreads. But nothing like the baladi bread I ate in Cairo. These are massive, and ingeniously, they don't need a rolling pin. Because one young lady, she takes the ball of dough, it's very, very loose dough, it's very slack dough, which, as we all know, that's going to be really good bread. That's how you start off, the dough goes on. This lady takes it so far, you keep the circle with a twist, all without kneading, all without rolling, and it's perfectly circular. It's a wonderful rhythm to it, because when one piece of dough is ready for the oven, 
the bread's ready to come out. And it's magic. It's just the art the flour, water, air, and a bit of salt. Doesn't that look handsome bread? Can I have a go? Ah, brilliant. Right? Can I? So the technique is... <laughs> oh, this bread. It's like trying to knit a jellyfish. But luckily, the molokaya is easier to handle. Ah, this is what's known as the pick-through. <laughs> you know, this reminds me when I was a kid and I'd sit there shelling peas with my mother and she used to make me whistle because if I stopped whistling, she was eating the peas. I'd love to help chop the leaves and garlic, but I've got a more important job. He's one month old. Some ways, I have the future of Egypt in my hands. I'll tell you what, son, you're going to grow up with some good bread, aren't you? Once the leaves are chopped, a stock is prepared. Uh -huh. yes. So it's salt, chicken stock and cumin. It's just a nice basic broth. And there it goes in. The molokaya only needs to cook for about five minutes. What's that? Zimna. 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 Oh, it's buffalo ghee. A generous dollop of crushed garlic is quickly fried. Oh, that smells good. Like, everything you see in this dish, it's all from within the radius of the farm. So the garlic's browned. Whoa. There I see. In true Delia style, she's deglazing the pan with a little of the stock so you waste none of the goodness at the bottom of the pan. Mm. Finny? Mm. Hey. In traditional Egyptian households, the men and children eat before the women. Mm. This bread's absolutely stunning. It's got texture. We saw it bake ten minutes ago. The soup's wonderful. It reminds me of wild garlic soup. Very nourishing, very good for you, and very tasty. Very pure tasting food. I mean, I think that's the thing about Egyptian cuisine. I think that's its triumph. It's not complicated, so the ingredients, the quality and the caring preparation is massive. And you can taste it. It's simple food and simplest is best. And simple works because the ingredients are absolutely superb. It's pure, it's got heritage, it's got love in it, you know. Ruby's family's hospitality is boundless, but there's so much more for me to discover. Bye, Ruby. Thank you. And I've still got half the country to explore. From Fayoum, I'm heading 300 miles south to Luxor in search of some classic Egyptian dishes and the world's earliest bread. Once the capital of ancient Egypt, Luxor is one of the hottest, driest cities on Earth. Welcome to Alaska! Thanks to the river, it's amazing what they can grow, but I mustn't be waylaid by the produce. I'm crossing to the West Bank. Most people come here for the archaeology, but I'm hoping to find living history. Proof of an ancient food revolution that changed the world. This place used to be a popular stop for day trippers, but these days, tourists are thin on the ground. Oh, crack it. Oh, yeah. Luckily, I'm here. And Egyptian bit. cotton? Yes, 100% cotton. Can, can I pick a colour? Yes, nice colour. Can I have blue? Can I have no. blue? No. Oh, it's well over 40 degrees. I need to cover my head before the sun boils my brain. That's better. Nice. I think so, yeah. I feel the spirit of T. Lawrence is upon me. Myers of Arabia. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I've suddenly remembered, I'm halfway through the trip, 
and I haven't looked at Kingy's list for prezzies. Have you seen this? Camel, rug, mummy, large. You... Oh, I'll pick up a few bits here and that'll do him. It's one. I think he'd love that. You see that, Bobby Dazzler? <laughs> it's not on his list. I don't know how much. 200. 200? No. 100. 180. 120. 180. 120. Not 20, no 80. 70. 150. 60. A bargain. He's going to love that. I think I'd better have a dark bag for that one. <laughs> I don't know. I'll get it all in one piece. Do I have to buy the three? Yeah. How much yeah. for three? 135. Thank you very much. Oh, go on then. 135. Oh, these blokes can spot a sucker when they see one. No, I don't want them. No. Okay, 50. No. Okay, 50. No, 50, I've, I've got 50. plenty. No. Okay, no, I've got one. I've got a scarab. The same, not the same. No, I've I don't see my shop. Of pots. I don't see my shop. No, I'm fat. It's lovely. For thirty quid, I've got an armful of tat, so I'm getting out while I can. To find the origins of our daily bread, I don't have to look far. The temples were built in the desert, but the land nearby has always been farmed. Mahmoud, it's Dave. Nice to meet you. Nice Mr. to meet Mayor. you too. Nice Thank to meet you. you too. Thank you. I've arranged to meet Mahmoud, whose family have farmed here for generations. Today they're starting their weekly bake. So far, I've only eaten flatbread, but this is different. It's called Shamsi bread, and it changed the eating habits of the planet. Without this ancient recipe, we wouldn't have sandwiches or even toast. All I read about Shamsi bread is. It is the first known leavened bread in the world. So, if we're talking at ground zeros, this is it for the loafers. We know it, Jim. What's in there, Mahmoud? This is a flour, yeah. salt and water. So there's no yeast, there's no, nothing to leaven the bread yet? Yeah, not yet. Ah, here comes the yeast. Yes. What is that yeast? Natural yeast. That's what we call a sourdough bread, which is the oldest, the best way of making bread in the world. The word shamsi means sun, and this is still the only bread in Egypt that's left to rise. There's no record of how the ancient Egyptians first came up with the idea of using yeast to leaven bread. It's my guess that it was a happy accident. With the sun this hot, the yeast wouldn't have needed long to work its magic. How long do we leave it to sit in the sun for? If the sun is hot, yeah. very strong, 20 minutes. And it's, uh, the sun is not strong, take 45 minutes. Uh -huh. yeah. I think where I leave my mood, it take about two days. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever buy bread? I love to, my wife to make the, my, our bread in the house. Yes. Because it's clean, fresh, and I see what she's been mixing. Yes. And also, when I engage to my wife, yes. I have to test her. She, if she make nice bread, then I can I continue. Yeah. But if she's not succeed, then I have to finish. I, I have to make the bread in my house. <laughs> she, yeah, and more important to make the nice bread. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mahmoud, why is she cutting the bread and pinching it? This is to make the bread looks. Uh, Beautiful. Just attractive. decoration? Yes, decoration. This is since long time. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. While the bread rises, a fire is lit beneath the clay oven. What she's doing now is she's got the rag dipped in water. She's cleaning the oven out with it. She can also tell if the oven's hot, because obviously it's sizzling. But I think like most baking, you get some steam in the oven, you get a better bread. So it's like a threefold thing. Right, it's in the oven, 20 minutes. This is where the magic starts. And we don't have to wait long before a wonderful smell wafts our way. Oh! You would like to try a little bit? Oh, gosh, yes. Fadal.
That's absolutely wonderful bread. The crust on it, in the wood-fired oven, the inside, it's soft, it's got texture, it's got spring, it's got life because of that yeast. It also has a wonderful taste. It's flavoursome bread. Do you know what I've learnt from this that I find absolutely awe-inspiring? Is that not so very far from this very spot, it was where mankind first started to leaven bread. That is to use yeast to make bread. Before they started in this place, everybody in the world ate flat bread. This really is like finding the Holy Grail. You know, I, I feel like I'm Indiana Jones and the Lost Loaf. It really is a privilege, my mood, to be here with you and your family. I've got huge respect for you all. And by crikey, your bread is amazing. But can I have a loaf to take with me? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. Mahmoud's village overlooks the enormous temple of Ramesses III. Hello. 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 Ah. Shamsi bread. <laughs> Ramesses ruled Egypt 1,200 years before the birth of Christ, and Shamsi bread would have been a staple of his household. You can imagine, like, the Victorians when they came here, thinking it was so clever with their empire. They must have thought this was built by people from another planet. We know so much about the ancient Egyptians because their civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. And they left behind an incredibly detailed record of their lives. I'm going to a small tomb, built not for royalty, but for a scribe. The guidebook says it's one of the most beautifully decorated ever discovered. Oh, wow. Oh, they, these colours are incredible, aren't they? How they've stayed like this over the years. How old is this tomb? This tomb in the, from the 1200 PC. Oh, crikey. So yeah. we're, we're over 3000 years ago. Because this is extraordinary. All of this is about food. We started with harvest scenes. Yes. I mean the wheat, okay, and then make the, 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 the wheat ready to make bread. This is also a record of what life was like for ordinary people. Look at these two guys under the tree. They are tired. They are in break now. Someone play music and the other one tired, want to sleep, and Look at the water tank here, it's skin, animal skin. Yeah. W water in it. What's this scene? Oh, it's, 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 it's the most important. This is the relationship, reflect the relationship between the god of afterlife, Osiris. This is the god of paradise. Right. And here is the deceased worshipping and present all kinds of offerings. All his favorite foods he presented for his God. So food had a part with the dead as well as the living. To live an afterlife, you must eat. You okay? need to feed the spirit. Yes. You see the bread? Yes. yes. It's and the same. It's like shamsi see? bread. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah. it, it, it was say when we made the shamsi bread, the ladies were doing exactly the same cuts to make the same shape of smile loaf I have with me. Yeah. The lady didn't know why they did it, but they certainly did it three and a half thousand years ago. And it's such a rich heritage that the Egyptians have. You know, it really is a window on the past. It's been great to have a glimpse through it as well. Tombs here show how important food was to the ancient Egyptians, in death as in life. On special occasions, families here still take food to the graves of their loved ones. On my journey so far, I've eaten street food or food with families. But there's a restaurant in Luxor that has a speciality I've been told that I shouldn't miss. Iman, it's Dave. Hi, Dave. Hello. Nice to see you. Oh, it's great you to meet you. Pleasure. To try this speciality, I've got to earn my keep. Ah, uh, this is great, Iman. Back in the kitchen, cooking with a mate. I will show you these very little pigeons. Egyptians love the pigeons, don't they? They do, they do. By the way, today is Thursday, and for Thursday there is a little story behind this. Why on Thursday? Pigeons are good for nice evenings for couples. So, Friday, tomorrow, it will really? be a free day. So, the guys love to eat pigeons this evening. Is pigeon an aphrodisiac? 
Yes, this is the traditional one. Get you going. Yes. Ooh la la! To turn these birds into natural Viagra, they need stuffing with red onion, finely chopped coriander and chopped garlic. So what's your favourite Egyptian dish? It's what we're doing now. The pigeon? The pigeon, yes. How many children do you have? <laughs> Two. <laughs> but they were not made up on Thursday evening. <laughs> Night off. The flavours are sorted to bring out the sweetness. Then it just needs seasoning. This is good. Yes, chef. Rice and cracked wheat or farik are separately simmered in stock. Once cooked, it's all mixed together, ready for stuffing. Rice. Now we start to do the, the difficult part of the whole thing. Our little pigeons. You always use this one. Open wide, patience. Because it's about putting as much as you can yeah. of this into each pigeon. The stuffed pigeons are poached for 10 minutes, then seared over a high heat. Look nice and plump, don't they? This is effectively the equivalent of putting your dinner on the sunbed. A little more flavour makes it look better. And everybody looks better with a tan. Mwah. Once crispy, they're ready to serve. This is a pharaoh's Very feast, isn't it? Even in one of Luxor's poshest restaurants, the food is unpretentious. In a country as fertile as this, the ingredients speak for themselves. Oh, look at that stuffing. The farik's well huge done. now. That's delicious. This is really good. The farik's lovely. It's really quite nutty. It's got some bite to it, but it's not crunchy. I've, I've cooked freak at home before and found it. Maybe it's the way I've done it. It's been a little too kind of crunchy, but this isn't. It's got the texture of brown rice, but it has loads and loads of flavour. And I suspect part of that is because it's cooked in the pigeon stock. The pigeon flesh, it's really, really juicy. It's lovely. I couldn't possibly reveal if stuffed pigeon works as an aphrodisiac, but I can tell you that in the morning, I had a certain spring in my step. There comes a time in every man's life when he's got to smarten up a bit, and this, for me, is it. Heading south towards Aswan, I'm finally getting to travel on the river. This historic vessel is the steamship Sudan. It's the last word in vintage style, so one feels duty-bound to dust off one's coolest suit. When the British first came on holiday to Egypt in the late 1800s, they travelled up the Nile on steamships like this. Fortunately, not much has changed. Oh, yes. I'm glad I dressed up now. Did you see the Oh, ding dong. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, shukran. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, shukran. You're welcome. The first tours of Egypt were organised by Thomas Cook, and the paddle steamer Sudan is the last survivor of the company's early vessels. Some tea and the sea. Agatha Christie travelled on this very boat in the 1930s. She was so inspired by the whole experience, she wrote Death on the Nile. The clientele are mainly French these days, so there's a high-end kitchen where I hear they make Egypt's most popular dessert, Ooh Mali. Uh, good morning, chef. Good morning. Hi. Hey, good morning. Hi. It's lovely to meet you. So what do you have there? Is that, is that a puff pastry, a meal foy? Tell me my get it, my fee. What's the end? Is this coconut? Yeah. Some, some golden, golden yeah. sultanas. Yeah. So that's some roasted hazelnuts. Yeah. She's building up really nicely. And a tiny, tiny amount of cinnamon. Small. 
small. Yeah, you don't want too much cinnamon. Now some hot milk. Hot milk. Ooh. When the hot milk hits the pudding, you can smell the cinnamon, the toasted coconut, the roasted almonds. It's going to be good. Did you used to eat this dish when you were a child? Yes. Mali, the akl mufaddala. Akl mufaddala Masriin, Egyptian. The mama, this is the the akl the only that we used to eat. The family used to eat it all. Do you think your Omali is better than your mother's? Yeah. <laughs> What's this chef? This is cream something. Chantilly cream. Yeah. I mean, the wonderful thing about this dessert, I mean, Omali, it sounds so Egyptian, but Omali, it's Omali, as in the Irish. There was an Irish lady, Mrs. Omali, and she was the lover of the Khadif, and she made this dessert for him and his children, and it spread through Egypt. Like a plague of locusts, and the Egyptians love it to this day. Do you know this is like the most delicate, refined bread and butter pudding I've ever seen. The umali takes just 15 minutes to bake, and smells amazing. Whoa! Strange umali. Oh, it's smelling good and it's looking good. Yeah. The coconut's been toasted, and those wonderful hazelnuts, and you got the milk instead of the custard, so it's lighter. It's all those wonderful chantilly topping for sweetness. It's absolutely lovely. Do you know I'm going to cook this for Kingy when I get home? This is a keeper. Mm. Ah, shukran, chef. Thank you. The last stop on my journey is as far south as the boat can take me. The city of Aswan sits at the top of Lake Nasser and is an ancient staging post for trade between Egypt and the rest of Africa. You know, the further south I get, the more timeless and remote, you know, Egypt seems. You get away from the hustle and bustle in the cities in the north and you can practically taste the history, you can feel it in the air. In 1902, the British dammed the Nile. The rising waters flooded local villages, displacing a people who had been living beside the river for thousands of years. This ancient civilization, the Nubians, were forced to resettle, many of them around Aswan. It's the last day of Eid el Adha, the feast of the sacrifice and a chance for me to try an ancient Nubian dish that has become a favourite across the entire Arab world. Is that a Nubian colour? I've been invited by the ferryman Basim and his uncle Izad to join their family celebrations. Oh. Bezam, it's beautiful. A beautiful home well, you have. Welcome. So do the whole family live here? Yeah, whole family live here, actually, uh -huh. in the summer. Yes. All the family, we prepare to sleep under the sky directly. We bring our bed here, outside, Yeah. and we sleep here all the night. Oh, so you're in the desert, you're sleeping under the stars with the people you love. Yeah. Hey, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that Nubians go to great lengths to guard their ancient traditions, and that includes their food. So what's on the menu today? Uh, the menu, actually, breakfast is liver. Uh-huh. And the lunch is but, Nubian uh, pata. Unfortunately, both meals are still on the hoof. That, that's lunch. It's a, it's a sheep, and um, it's been slaughtered. But, you know, if you're going to eat it, you have to face up to it. It was a living thing. All over the world, millions of Muslim households are sacrificing their best animal to mark this feast. Mercifully, for the sheep and for me, here it's a quick and efficient process. So you can see the people here, they like this. Uh -huh. And they are hanging in the wool. Oh, they should have put the handprints. Bringing the luck or like this, they think. Uh-huh. 
The whole sheep is a lot of meat, but nothing will get wasted. In our feast, when we sacrifice this sheep, yeah. it must divide it to three. One third we give it to the poor people. Yeah. One third we must invite our family yes. and the neighbor like yeah. this. And one third it's for the house. Right? It must be like this in, in the feast. Okay, so that's okay. proper social care, isn't it? It's, it's care for your neighbors. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's the liver. Yeah, this is the liver. This is the liver. And that's breakfast. This is the heart that's coming now. Uh huh. It's the heart. The heart. Yeah. The offal is still warm. I've never eaten liver this fresh. Breakfast. Hello, I'm Dave. Mushira. Pleased to meet you, Mushira. Me too. Chef, what should I do? Cat. Uh huh. Just how? Yes, like this. Yeah. Right, so the liver, the heart, it's again chopped. Yes. Yeah. The heart's good meat. I mean, you, you need to core it properly. And that's the, the, the testicles, they go in as well. Tough old nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Sheep's nuts are all right. It's a lot of good meat. It's lean. I mean, that, if you didn't know, you'd think it was a chicken breast. It's really good meat. Do you think I have the potential to make a Nubian chef? <laughs> <laughs> Got the spicing going in, and it's that Middle Eastern trinity of coriander, cumin, and salt. It's really pure, simple cooking, but it's really, really fresh. Couldn't get much fresher meat. It's going to be really nice, you know. Hello. 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 So this is the main event. This is the fatter. It is mutton, it's not lamb. It, it's grown on a bit and it's very fresh. What is the spice? Is that cumin? Filthily sweet. Flavour's going to build up lovely. True to form, they will of course be fresh bread. The Nubians have a recipe so ancient, it predates the invention of the oven. It's traditionally made on a hot plate. What's the bread made from? The bread made from the corn. Yeah. And yeast. Yes. Some uh, salt. Yes. And some uh, lettuce fingers, dry oh, lettuce fingers. Some dried okra. We yeah. Do okra. Okra or ah. lettuce fingers. It's interesting because it's the first bread I've had in Egypt that's a cornbread. Could I taste a little bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm, that's good, isn't it? Mm? Mm, that's really like good. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. And it's soft, you can eat it without anything, yeah? Yeah, you, I could sit there and eat the lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good. It's good. It's really good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Breakfast is just the start of the feast, but what a way to begin. The fresh liver is served with side dishes of fool, falafel and pickles. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Come on, chef. Oh. It's beautiful. This is the best food I've had in Egypt. I'm sorry, the rest of Egypt. The liver with the rest of the offal. It's so soft, spicy and flavoursome. The bread's great. And you get chips with your breakfast. <laughs> you know, it's so wrong, but it's so right. Do you think I'm too old to be adopted? <laughs> <laughs> but between courses, there's time for a smoke. <laughs> <laughs> they do this seven times, it takes away the evil eye. Nubian chimney. Yeah. <laughs> After an hour of fairly vigorous boiling and bubbling, the mutton is done. Fatter isn't just mutton, though. It's a clever dish assembled from a number of elements, each with a distinctive flavour. Oh, 
this looks good. good. This is a proper feast, isn't it? Yeah. Mmm. It's so good. It's a wonderful dish. The thing is, the mutton is just falling off the bones. It's really, really tender. But I love the textures of it. You know, you've got the bread, which was crispy, soaked in that wonderful stock. Remember the spices in the stock? Then you get the rice, half of it's fried, half isn't. Then you've got the tomato sauce with loads and loads of onions and garlic. And then, of course, you've got the, the mutton on the top. The lovely thing is, you share it together. It's a festival dish. Of course, at any party after the feasting, there's entertainment. And on occasions like this, the village band goes from house to house. Time to bust out my Strictly moves. It's been an amazing week. I just have to sit this one out. I went looking for the pure Egyptian food. And in a way, I found that in Cairo. But as I got south, it got better and better. I feel I've discovered a cuisine that should be appreciated more than it is. Not only do Egyptians know the secret of the perfect falafel, it turns out they're responsible for inventing our daily bread. And the Nubians can take credit for a dish that's a favourite across the Arab world. In Egypt, the ingredients are king, or rather pharaoh. The food may be simple, but it's good enough to have kept the people going for thousands of years. It's a culture, a religion of beauty and grace. That's what I found by the bucketful in Egypt. I've also learned that I can dance and enjoy myself without being full of beer. Unfortunately, I've got a plane to catch and I'm a five-hour drive from the airport. Crikey, when I ordered a taxi, this wasn't quite what I had in mind. Next time, Scottish chef Tony Singh goes in search of the authentic flavours of India. I'm starving and I want to find out what we have for breakfast in Punjab. And uncovers his family roots on a journey that never stops surprising. I've been asked him for tea. And you can see Tony travel to India next week at the same time here on BBC Two. Next tonight, television royalty Scylla Black and John Bishop join in the back chat with Jack Whitehall and his dad. While over on BBC Four, Storyville explores the extraordinary and tragic life of internet activist Aaron Swartz, the internet's own boy.